Persona 5 Royal was a game I didn't know I was ready for. About two and a half to three years ago at this point, I played Persona 5, the, the original, for the very first time. It was my first Persona game that I had ever played before, and yeah, call me whatever you want, but it just was my first Persona game. I didn't know what to expect, I didn't know what I was getting, I didn't know what was going to happen once I started playing, but l lucky for me, once I actually started playing the game, something changed, something happened, and I just couldn't stop playing it and I just wanted to keep playing more and more and more. After I was done playing the original Persona 5, all I really remember of my first playthrough to be honest was just falling in love with the characters, falling in love with the world, falling in love with just the repetitious gameplay that does occur. And yeah, you could say that the gameplay is repetitious, but the way that they handle that repetition is done in a way that is just something that I had never experienced before in any game that I had ever played before in the past, and experiencing that for the first time was just absolutely amazing. And there on out, I just had kept on waiting until we would get essentially a Persona 4 Golden for Persona 5, the original, and we finally got that about a month ago for Persona 5, with Persona 5 Royal, and I am beyond ecstatic even after I was done with my first playthrough. Um, Still, I'm actually about to be almost done with my New Game Plus playthrough, but uh, I think I'm just going to keep playing it more and more and more, to be honest, because this thing has just been all on my mind for the past, like I said, four weeks, month, uh, like a month and a week or so. Just It's all I've been thinking about. It's all I've been wanting to play. This game did something to me that I didn't think any other game would be able to do since I was a kid. So without further ado, I'm just ready to go ahead and start talking about what this game has to offer in terms of gameplay, story, and many, many other things. So I want to keep this section of the video as brief as possible just because of the simple fact that it just doesn't need to go on any longer than it actually needs to and I just wanted to kind of have this little brief segment of the video where I just talk about the music for a second because <laughs> I always keep saying to almost anyone who hasn't played this game, uh, one of the best features is the music and the music is just absolutely amazing in this game. Um, there are a lot of games that have some of my favorite soundtracks ever, you know, Final Fantasy VII, Red Dead Redemption, Red Dead Redemption 2, uh, God of War, all those songs are so, or all those games have such unique sounding soundtracks and I had never heard anything like Persona 5 before and I went back and listened to some of the music that's been played during when you were, would play through Persona 3 and 4 and some of that music is absolutely phenomenal as well. Um, just hearing this, the music for the first time, hearing the opening beginning song for uh, for Persona 5 Royal in the original, uh, it's it's honestly pretty insane just how amazing the, just the music is in general. I just I've never listened to a soundtrack where I've just continuously put a singular song even just on repeat or find an extended version of it on, on YouTube just to fucking sit there and do something else whilst the music is playing. Persona 5 has some of my favorite music in video game history and they even added a few new songs for Persona 5 Royal and some of that music is absolutely phenomenal. Now, I'm not going to say which one specifically because those are soundtracks that you should hear on your own for your first time playing through the game yourself, but some of the songs that they added are amazing. The composition, the vocals, the lyrics, everything about the soundtrack is just absolutely phenomenal and I can't praise it more than I already kind of have in this one short segment of the video so without you know keeping this delayed a lot longer than I would rather it be I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up and say just it's phenomenal if you've never heard any of the soundtrack uh, play the game listen to some of the soundtrack yourself do whatever you can just to experience some of the best music that you've ever hear in gaming <laughs> There were two things that I was really concerned about talking about in uh, this review. Two specific things that I thought I would have some trouble just discussing. Not really discussing, but just explaining like the ways around it. Because if you didn't play the game, then obviously you don't know what the gameplay and the story is all about. Which is really a good thing and it's much preferred that you didn't know about it. But if you want to know what to expect, I'm going to try to explain it as 
the best of my ability that I can. So to kind of to simplify things a little bit, every single activity that you do in the overworld and outside of dungeons is all centered around time. There's The date is right there on the top left hand corner of your screen and it tells you everything that you need to know. What month you're in, what day of the week it is, whether it's sunny or raining and etc etc. It, it tells you everything that you need to do and on the top, top right hand corner of the screen if you're ever lost at any point in the story or what your ne next objective is go and look at that corner and you'll know to have you'll have a general idea of what you probably should be doing next so the general consists of the gameplay outside of dungeons is basically you interacting with the world and the characters as much as possible and ranking up confidants and confidants are relationships that you build with specific characters in the game and they're pretty obvious and they're not really too hard to mess besides Maybe one of them, but you'll know when it eventually ends up leading towards a specific confidant because it's pretty unique all on its own. And if you're ever confused about which confidants are missable in any sort of way, I'll go ahead and link down in the description some guides that you can go ahead and look up, especially when we discuss things a little bit further on with more gameplay stuff. So if confidants are very important. If you don't rank up these confidants, your ending is going to vary, but confidants aren't just important because you're interacting with them a lot and you're learning more about their characters and their backstories. But some of them net you really neat abilities and some of them revolve around having to save time because every single activity that you do within the game passes time. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, making coffee or cooking curry. It doesn't matter if you're spending a day with one of your confidants. It doesn't matter if you're going to some fast food place and eating a giant burger. Every single activity in this game progresses further in time. You have you have day and night, and you're also a student to an academy called Student Academy, and progressing further in terms of that also progresses time in the game. Uh, and you also have stats. You also have not social stats, but they are stats that do depend on some of the activities that you do. There's knowledge, perception, charm, kindness, and guts, and I think maybe one more that I'm forgetting. I'm not really sure, to be honest. But they all start at 1, and you can rank up to 5. And the reason why these stats are important in particular is because you aren't able to progress in certain confidant missions unless you have a specific rank in that confidant. And some of the, li some of the guides that I'm going to be linking in the description will tell you what comp uh, what link or not link uh stat level you need to be in order to progress further so you don't need to worry about that just look up look up on that guide and you won't be lost in any sort of way and that's mostly just the stuff that has to involve with doing stuff outside of the dungeons uh you know you can read books you can go and hang out in the music parts with your friends you can go to a specific place where you can play darts and uh billiards pool uh, just anything that you think that you can do, you can go ahead and do it. Some stuff increases your HP, some stuff increases your SP, which is what you use in battle to be able to use certain spells and abilities that belong to your persona, which we'll get into that in a little bit. And this, all this is very important, and if you're ever worried about not having enough time to be able to do everything as much as possible in terms of ranking up all your confidants to the max level, you don't have to worry about that. You have more than enough time to be able to do everything as much as possible in one singular playthrough. If you know what you're doing, then you can do it. But like I said, if you're having trouble and you're wondering how to do a specific thing, there are multiple guides out there and some of them are going to be linked down in the description. So I really advise that you go ahead and use them if you are ever having trouble at any point in the game. And that's just stuff revolving around outside of the dungeons. And now we go inside of the dungeons and... There are mainly two of them, and some of them are called palaces, and some of them, are, and you can refer to them as mementos. Regardless, you go to an, a place called the metaverse, and you access people's palaces, which we can explain later on once we get to the story bit of the video. But palaces and mementos is essentially your dungeons of the game. Palaces belong to a specific person in general, and you'll know who that is when the story tells you who it is. And mementos belongs to essentially everybody, and you can go fight random mobs and collect random loot in that one specific area of the game. And you'll know when you get it, because the game will literally tell you that you got it. So... That's pretty much it, and the general consensus of the both of them is palaces are more 
typical dungeon like where you have to go explore and go through a specific thing in order to create a certain puzzle and you have to solve this certain puzzle in order to progress further into the palace so and then you fight have to fight a couple bosses and then you end up fighting the final boss and then you get rewarded with certain loot and certain experiences from doing that and there's a lot of treasure chest in the palaces so i highly advise that you make it tons of lock picks because those things are going to come really important until you get the perma pick and that won't be a thing that you get until basically the end of the game so uh, just make a ton of picks whenever you have time to be able to do that when you think you have enough time and you don't have anything to do throughout the day just if you're going to take anything to heart take that into heart if you're playing this game make a lot of picks to open up a lot of treasure tests because you're going to see a lot of them, and then you're going to be really upset when you don't have a pick in order to be able to open them. And yeah, you fight mobs in those dungeon areas, palaces, and mementos by using your persona. And your persona are unique in their own ways. Your party has one specific persona, but you as the player are actually able to use a multitude of different persona that have all types of different abilities. And some of them actually also have unique abilities that only they can have exclusively to themselves. And you can make your persona as powerful as you want to. There, Again, there are guides in the description that are going to be able to help you out how to make some really powerful persona. But you aren't going to be able to do that until a certain point in the game and with certain confidants. But you can do that. But for the general consensus of your first playthrough, I would say just use the powerful persona that you get you know, at that point in the game. And really specialize in using a lot of... Uh, uh skill abilities you know like if you see like like wind amp get that for your persona if you use a lot of uh, wind spells on that specific persona just focus on that a couple of times whenever you see a skill like that and yeah you're also able to create persona and get them new abilities and new traits and traits is actually something new and specific towards persona 5 royal as a game it didn't exist in the original but now it does and essentially the only thing that you really need to know about it is it's just a little extra ability that a persona gets completely for free you don't have to try to give them give them that ability they just get it from either uh, fusion or they already had it when you first obtained them so some of them can uh, revolve around uh, making the stat, the stat increase buffs lasting for one to two turns, uh, doing more technical damage, doing more uh, baton pass damage, or gaining more damage after a baton pass, and just doing more damage in general. A lot of them are very unique. A lot of them are very different. There are certain personas that have unique trait abilities, and you'll know when they are when you do see them. Uh, there's a couple of other stuff as well. Like, you have a basic attack weapon, uh, some weapon, some characters have different type of looking weapons, but they all essentially act the same way. Uh, you can get unique abilities on those type of weapons, depending on uh, if you create them from your persona, which you can do in an area called the Velvet Room. Uh, that's also where you do f uh, persona fusion. Uh, a couple other things. Technical damage is, is when you increase, or not increase, when you uh in inflict the status ailment on a specific enemy and you hit them with the specific spell or attack that you know is able to do increased damage and will knock them down potentially which is incredibly useful for early on in the game and i highly advise that whenever you see uh stuff like dizzy confuse uh despair and stuff like that whenever you see uh, a persona that has that or if your allies have those type of abilities Keep them on them at all times in your first playthrough because it's going to come more in handy than you know. Because certain uh, shadows, as they're called in the game, they don't have any weaknesses. And you need to solely rely on technical damage unless you have a super beefed up persona that you've created through f uh, fusion. Uh, but you can't do that until a certain point in the game. And I learned that from experience. So trust me when I say that. Uh, there's a couple other things. Like you have gun. You have a gun that allows you to just be able to do... A different type of physical damage and some certain enemies are weak to that some enemies are completely nullified to that and eventually when you unlock an ability through confidant you're able to get a guaranteed knockdown for limited time uses on it's very useful in certain situations i haven't really needed to use it too often but i would imagine depending on how you play it might be more useful to you than it was for me 
because it used to be way better than the original game, but that's besides the point. Uh, there's a lot more stuff that I can really talk about, but if I went on and tried to explain everything that the gameplay has to involve with doing, I would kind of be here all day, and I feel like I'm not really explaining it too much. It's not that hard, and it's not that confusing to really understand and get a grasp on, because the game does everything in its way to explain everything to you, and if you're ever confused, you can always, you know, find help online, because there are tons of people who are trying to help others understand the game a lot better and some of them know the game way better than even I do so if you need help there's always help out there I'm just trying to give you a general idea of what to expect as you're playing the game and some of the stuff that is helpful and some things that you'll be able to unlock once you progress further into the game and that's kind of it uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a general gameplay loop, but the loop ends up becoming something that you end up really enjoying and end up really loving to do. Just being able to explore all around Tokyo and, uh, Tokyo, Japan, and being able to hang out with your other confidants and learning more about their characters and the story, uh, their backstory. Uh, it's very interesting to do and you end up really liking the characters and we'll get into that type of discussion uh, next, because next I think it's time that we finally talk about the story and characters. As I said earlier in the video, gameplay and story was the two things that I had really a really hard time of comprehending what I wanted to say, especially with the, with the story. Um, because the story for Persona 5 Royal is pretty much... The same with slight differences and deviations from the original story. Uh, just very slightly different deviations, like with new characters getting introduced and slightly other things that change, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's majority the majority of the game is still pretty much the same, besides the ending of the game, which I'm going to give you a brief plot synopsis and summary of what the main game entails, and then we're going to go into the third semester, which is where most of the new story beats actually come into play and is the thing that I really want to talk about the most because it's well obviously the new stuff and I think it's also very important and it's a lot of stuff that has been on my mind ever since I was done with my first playthrough and it goes into a lot of why I really like this game so much along as, as long as well with the other characters or the other new characters and much much more other than just that so we'll get into explaining that into a a little bit but I'm gonna give you that brief summary of the main game entails uh, so let's begin so because I want to go ahead and hurry up and get to the stuff that I really want to talk about with the story of the game I'm gonna go ahead and give you a very simple explanation of the story from the original version of the game there's slight deviations like I said but there's not really much else to really talk about you play as a character and his name is Joker. That's what he goes as when he's a member of the Phantom Thieves, but for the sake of things of being simplistic, we're just going to refer to him as Joker because you can call him by any name you want and the community can't decide between the two names that he's been given and very other sources, various other sources of media that has to revolve around Persona 5. So for the video, we're just going to refer to him as Joker. Before the events of the main game, he's taken into court for a crime he didn't commit he was he was accused of assaulting a man and a woman that he didn't do and he was sent to court and he lost therefore he was sent to somewhere else than other than when he was currently living for probation and he was then sent to go to school in Shujin Academy where he would take part in his studies for about a year that's what the game entails but about a year that's his probation time and once it was over he would go back home but things didn't turn out the way that he wanted to because eventually he would accidentally end up in a place called the Metaverse where he's able to interact with people's palaces and the palaces are the manifestations of people's distorted desires. Along the way, as he's channeling or investigating these palaces, he meets a group of members and forms the team called the Phantom Thieves. You meet these characters along the way through interacting with them in the real world and then obviously going throughout the palaces with them some of them are enemies at first but then you grew to become friends and they're pretty much your party members for the rest of the game 
And that's kind of the simplistic version of it without going into really major detail, but a lot of the detail that I can't go into is stuff that would be considered spoilers, and I don't really want to talk about that and have this video be longer than it really needs to be. So, because I really want to... <laughs> I really want to get into the things that I really want to talk about, which has to involve with the end of the game, with the third semester, with the brand new content of the game, uh, including with the new characters, and that's really what I want to talk about, so... Just to get that out of the way, I went ahead and shortened it out as short as possible and make it make sense to a certain extent of kind of the general consensus of what happens at the beginning of the game and what's going to be happening later on in the future as you progress further with the story. I want to talk about the stuff that happens towards the end of the game, though, because that's where I think things get really interesting. Real question to be asked, where have I been? Okay, so from here on out, there are going to be spoilers about the ending of the game, uh, the you know the final part of the game, and just something that has to involve one of the pivotal characters that of the game. And if you don't want to hear any of this, obviously skip forward into the video. I'll put a timestamp on the screen to where you can go ahead and just skip um, anything that has to involve spoilers. Um, but until then, I'm going to be talking about the ending of the game and the final, you know, activities that you do for the end of the ending of the game, and just going to give my opinion on all that, my opinion about all that, and explain why it's amazing. So, skip if you don't want to hear it, stay if you do. So when I finally got to the last part of the game, uh, I wasn't, I, I didn't know what to expect. Because because by the middle point of the game, towards sort of about the end point of the game, I'm not I'm not really sure when it was. I don't really remember. I think it was not even the middle of the game. It might have been a little over towards the middle of the game. Regardless, it's just regardless. Who cares about that? Um, you see a palace for the first time, or not for the first time, but you see a different palace for the first time that, you, that we've never seen before. This this one never existed in the original game, and I always was wondering throughout my first playthrough, what was it about? Are we ever going to see it again? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. A bunch of thoughts went through my mind, and I didn't really know what was going on. But then after you know, Shido's Palace, uh, not even Shido's Palace actually. No, it was uh, after you fight Yodabouth, uh, You know, the actual ending of the game from the original version of it. I didn't know what they were going to do. I knew they were going to do, like, the whole Christmas thing and, you know, maybe Joker was going to still have to, you know, turn himself in and et cetera, et cetera. But that didn't, it didn't turn out that way. And all of a sudden, it went into New Year's and then it went into the third semester and then everything was just drastically different than what it actually was. Everyone was acting as if they, the events that had transpired in their lives never happened, especially because... Morgana was fucking human. Futaba's mom was alive. Uh, Madarame is still Yusuke's sensei. And Ryuji was still on the track team. And Haru's father is still alive. Makoto's, you know, father is alive. Everything was just drastically different than what it was. And then, of course, you know, Akechi was still alive. And we had, he, he was, you know, assumed to have died in the original game. He was still alive. And... It was really weird the first time that I, ever, that I experienced this. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't know why it was like this. And everything was all so confusing. But then as we started exploring the palace a little bit. Because the, the palace that we that you had would seen earlier in the game comes back. And it's apparently visible to everybody in the real world. Not just inside of the metaverse. And the Metaverse also comes back as well, because if you remember, if you played the original game, uh, the Metaverse has to get completely eradicated and disappeared, so that way everything would go back to normal. Uh, but the, the palace that you saw earlier in the game is there. It's visible in the overworld, the real world itself. And so, Joker, Akechi, and Kasumi end up going on, over there and they start investigating it. And then you start seeing things about Kasumi that involves her life and her past experiences regarding around her herself and her sister. And then it ends up, you end up hearing the bombshell that the entire time, throughout the entirety of the game, Kasumi wasn't really who she said she was. 
It was all because of a change in her cognition that made her believe that she was Kasumi. And that her younger sister had died when it turned out that the younger sister was still alive and she was that younger sister. She was actually Sumire Yoshizawa and her older sister had died saving her life. And just hearing this whole like backstory, like her as a character, I had already grew to really like and really appreciate this character being in the game because just her personality was just super interesting. Just the fact that she was so determined with, you know, being a, uh, a gymnastics, you know, person, just everything that she was doing, I was all for it. Just, you know, being there and helping her in every step of the way was just something that was really enjoyable the experience with her and to then eventually find out that she's actually Sumire Yoshizawa she's the younger sister was a huge blowback to me because they never they never hint once at all that she was going to be Sumire and not Kasumi we just you, throughout the entirety of the game even like when you first find out her name you pick up like this like i don't really know what to call it but she drops something and it has her name in it and even that says that her name is kasumi yoshizawa so everything points to her being kasumi you know and the way that you find out her name i just assumed that that was just a quirky way of finding out what her name was before she was planning to go ahead and tell you but no it turns out that she's actually sumire not kasumi and her identity was changed through her cognition she was made to believe that she was kasumi and that everyone around her was calling her by that name when in reality everyone was calling her by her real name sumire and she just thought that oh everyone was calling her kasumi and she didn't think anything of it and her backstory after you've learned who her, her true identity is it's tragic because she blames herself for this, the death of her sister because they were both, you know, they did gymnastics together. They were both gymnasts together and they did everything together, you know, because they, and they were even identical twins as well. They were twin sisters. They did everything together and they wanted to reach the top of the gymnastics world together. But Kasumi was just, Sumire thought in her head that Kasumi was just better in every single way and that she didn't really even need to be around anyways. And so she just really downplayed herself and downplayed her abilities and eventually got to a point where she just, she just started running away and then eventually got to the point where she almost got hit by a moving vehicle and her sister saved her life but in turn would kill Kasumi. And just to see that and to see her reaction to re reliving that moment and really remembering who she really is and her trying to beg the player character you the player joker she's begging you to go back to what she was before she doesn't want to take the survivor's guilt she's going through this tra this traumatic experience all over again in her head and she's having survivor's guilt because she keeps taking the responsibility of what happened to her sister to heart and so heavily and to the point where you have to eventually have to fight her you have to battle against her and try to make her come back and it's just it's really sad and it's really relatable because for anyone who's ever been in a similar situation like that where they've had survivor's guilt for a situation that they had a part in in a way it's just it's tragic it's a tragic situation and she has a traumatic backstory and you really feel for her as a character Especially because she was built up to be, you know, Kasumi. And you end up find, finding out who she really is. And then you just want to save her all the more. Because she can still change who she really is. And throughout the entirety of the rest of her confidant missions. It's basically you trying to learn who she really is. And trying to formulate a plan for her. And for her life. And for her to eventually grasp the situation that she's in. Her sister may be gone. But she's never going to be forgotten and she's always going to be with her and she should still tr strive for that dream that they both had together and accomplish that for the sake of her sister. And it's just a situation that you really want to be a part of and you really care about this character and you really love being around with her because even though she's, you know, acting a little bit different than what she was before, because of the help with you, because of her, because of you being in her life. 
you get to help her out in every step of the way and then you end up growing an attachment towards her and she ends up back to pretty much how she was when you first met her in the beginning of the game of course this traumatic experience is never going to be you know erased entirely that's not how a situation like that happens she's always going to remember that experience but now she's going to be able to move past that and become a much more productive member of society like how she had tried to be as kasumi but this time as her real self and I really enjoyed that just character arc and that character growth and just how they how they handled her. Because, you know, she unlocks a persona. She ends up later on by the third semester becoming a member of the Phantom Thieves. And just all this stuff revolving around her and everything that she does in the game. Even to the point where, you know, the topic of the Phantom Thieves with you, her, and Akechi gets brung up. She disagrees with the Phantom Thieves, but she actually brings up a logical standpoint of looking at them and it's very perfectly understandable and you sort of agree with that to a sense but because you remember the Phantom Thieves obviously you already know that it's not exactly like the way that she thinks that they're doing it which you know is a situation that would happen if stuff, something like that would happen in the real world and I just really loved how they handled her character I really loved with how they just handled everything about her and it was great but even better to a certain extent I feel like they handled they handled Dr. Maruki even better. Dr. Maruki, when he was first shown off in a trailer, a Japanese trailer, like over a year ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago at this point, he, sh he was shown off to be just a counselor for the students at Shujin Academy, and he was to potentially become one of your confidants. And at first, that's what he actually ends up becoming. He's a new counselor for the, you know, the students of Shujin Academy after the traumatic events of what happened with the volleyball team in Kamoshida. He shows up very shortly after those events transpire in the beginning of the game. And the more that you learn about him, the more that you realize that he's actually into cognitive science like Wakabe Ishiki, Futaba's mother. And you start helping him, you know, understand, you know, cognitive science a little bit because of your involvement with the metaverse. And then eventually, as the game progresses further and further and further, and just before you're about to infiltrate and steal the treasure from Sainijima, you interact with him for the final time uh, to get the max rank, and he basically says that his cognitive science research is complete, and that his role as the, the so, uh, not social studies, uh, the counselor for Shujin Academy, that job is over, and he's going to be leaving. And... You know, that's what ends up happening. You never see him ever again. He just ends up disappearing and you, you just never see him. Well, he ends up showing back in the third semester, but not in the place where you thought it was. The palace that you hadn't seen, you know, by like the midpoint towards like of the game, that's his palace. He's the ruler of that palace and he has twisted, distort distorted desires. This is my favorite palace of the game, and it's for all the opposite reasons of any of the other palaces. All the other palaces, their desires are twisted in a way that's completely different than what Maruki is. Maruki's desires is to desperately help those who are in need, for those who are put into situations that they may not favor, but they're stuck in. He wants to help them and rewrite their cognition and rewrite your cognition it means change reality itself because he's the reason why the members of the phantom thieves lives are significantly different at by the beginning of the third semester are significantly different that's all his doing he so desperately wants to help people that he's forcing people to live in a reality that they had no part in and this reason alone is the reason why this has become my favorite palace because he's not even really the bad guy Mar Dr. Maruki isn't the bad guy. He's not the final bad guy of the game because even the Phantom Thieves themselves, the characters, they even expressly say that he's not even really necessarily a bad guy and that people's lives are actually, you know, turned around and are better for the good and people are actually happy and there's no more hardship. But the problem with that is that he's forcing these people to live this reality against their will. And... That's literally the exact opposite thing of what they were doing when they were fighting Yoldabaoth. Yoldabaoth, his whole thing was the fact that he was forcing people to live in a reality where it would just be whatever it is. 
and it was his doing. He was controlling what they saw reality as it was to be. Maruki was doing the exact same thing, but when you look at it at face value, you look at it and you're thinking, oh, he's just trying to help people, but it's still not right. It's not right to force people to live a certain life that they had no control in. People should have their own freedom of will to be able to do whatever they want. And that's the whole point of being able to unlock your own persona, which he has, by the way. He has a persona that allows him to do it. The whole thing about having a persona is that you finally have unlocked the true potential of what your your will wants to do. And with that power, it manifests into your, its own strength and you're able to use it in battle in the metaverse. Maruki isn't... You know, like I said, he isn't the bad guy. He's not doing bad things. He's trying to help people, but he's doing it in the most negative way possible. And you see the entirety of his life through flashback sequences and through his own memory. Because there are these little CRT TVs with, you know, VHS, you know, tapes that reveal events in his life. Like, after the events of what happened with his fiance Rumi... She was the first person that he ever changed you know, their reality, their cognition to the point where they believe a reality is different than what it actually is. To the point where she ends up being better, but she could have done that on her own if he hadn't done that in the first place. And that's not exactly right. And there are a couple other flashback sequ sequences that show that he's just trying desperately to get the fundings for his cognitive science research. And then that ends up getting pulled. And then finally, with the help that you had given him... He was able to prove that it is a thing, it does exist, and that it still wouldn't work out anyways. But with his power, he's able to rewrite the cognition of those in reality and basically force people to live in a world where he deems it to be correct. And the best example that I can show that what he's doing isn't correct is... After a certain point when you go and progress further in his palace, you end up getting tasked to do... Essentially a multiple choice questionnaire where essentially you have two or more choices and both of these choices involve scenarios where they're both not exactly wrong but they're both not exactly right. But regardless of whichever one you choose, he still changes the reality of what you live in. So it doesn't matter to be so it doesn't matter in the end. It doesn't matter if you choose the right decision or the wrong decision. Both of them are right uh, both of them are incorrect in his in his mind. And if you don't do the things that he deems it to be correct, then he changes your cognition. He changes your reality to what he deems to be correct. And he forces you to live in a reality where he deems things to be okay for you. That's not the reality that you chose. Those aren't the choices that you made. But he's making those choices for you. He's forcing you to live in a reality in which he deems it correct. And you have no say in it. You have nothing to do with the choices that matter. Besides other than what Dr. Markey deems to be correct. And that's why you as the leader of the Phantom Thieves and the other members of the Phantom Thieves themselves decide to go after Dr. Markey, steal his treasure, and stop him. And essentially save the world for a second time at the end of the game. And it ends up working out better anyways. People's lives end up being better. Even Dr. Markey, even after everything that happened with him... At the post credit scene that I got, which is the true ending, he ends up better in the end anyways. He ends up being a better person, he ends up doing the right thing. He ends up trying to move on and live a better life. It wasn't what he was trying to do with people when he had the power to be able to change people's cognitions. He wasn't helping people, he was forcing them to live in a reality that wasn't right. Or rather, it was right, but only in his mind it was. People may have been happy, but they had no control in it whatsoever. But he ends up being better in the end anyways. He tries to move on from the situation. He tries to end up becoming a better person. And he thanks you for that. And it's those reasons alone why Dr. Maruki's palace is easily my favorite palace of the game. And why he's very close to becoming one of my, you know, one of my top favorite characters. He already is one of my favorite characters. I already really liked his personality and the way that he interacts with you in the game but i'm talking about like top five you know favorite characters of the game he's done exceptionally well in this game and the way that they handled him the way that they make him the way that they portray him as not really necessarily being the bad guy right 
but being an antagonist was something else. Because there's a difference between being the bad guy and being the antagonist. An example that I could sort of give is that Akechi, he's not really a bad guy, but he's done bad things. He's trying to do things just to get to a certain objective. And even then, he tries to help you in, in the long run anyways, revolving around the third semester. So he ends up being more of an anti-hero slash antagonist at certain points earlier on in the game when you're fighting against uh, Shido. And even throughout the entirety of the game anyways. And speaking of which, Shido... He is very blatantly the bad guy. He has done terrible things for his own benefit and doesn't care for anyone else's saying things. Um, but yeah, I just think they handled Dr. Marky really well. I think he was done really well. Uh, I think I already just said that. <laughs> he was handled really well and I really enjoyed with what they did with him. He's becoming a you know top favorite character for me and I really love the int introduction and inclusion of him. I think the game wouldn't have been the same if he didn't exist within the game itself and was essentially the final boss of the game. Because with the whole third semester, um, the way that you're only able to actually unlock it is you need to get max rank uh, with Sumire. You need to get uh, rank 9 before a certain time period with Dr. Maruki, which is pretty much before you infiltrate Sai's uh, palace, so do that. And you have to get to rank 8 before infiltrating Sai's Palace as well with a Kenji. That's Those are the only ways they're able to unlock it. Um, yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed the third semester. I think there's a lot of things that the third semester uh, introduces that are really good. I think the new outfits that those characters are wearing are super good. They look super... They look so good. They look so fucking good. Uh, some of the new persona that you're able to unlock through the final... Sem uh, third semester, sorry. Uh, I think they all look really cool and I think they're really neat inclusions. And yeah, the third semester was definitely everything that I really wanted it to be. Plus, it gave me more time to be able to do a lot of things that I hadn't been able to do earlier on in my first playthrough, which was really cool. So let's go ahead and wrap up this portion of the video and finally end off this video because it's already gone on long enough. All right, let's wrap up the video and let's wrap it up quickly. Persona 5 was a game that I had never played before, obviously, and I had never played a Persona game ever in my life. And then I, play, I finally played Persona 5, and it was an experience that I could never really forget. It was, it was a joy to experience these characters and the world and the gameplay and just everything about the game that made Persona special. It's unique quirks, it's funny moments, it's really weird. Uh, quirky, corny, but still enjoyable voice acting and voice line specifically because, you know, every now and again a character will just say for real for no apparent reason. They say that like 500 times within the span of like one chapter. But regardless of the fact of that, this game really means a lot to me and it was something really special to me when I first played the original version of the game for the first time, like two and a half three years ago. I don't really remember how long it's been since I first played it. But when I found out that Persona 5 Royal was getting made, I was beyond ecstatic. I finally played it. I got it day one. And I am still playing it to this day. I still can't keep my hands off of the controller when I'm, you know, thinking about playing this game. It's just everything that I've been wanting from a continuation of the original Persona 5 story. Uh, not really continuation, but it's more. It adds more, and I think it's just the definitive Persona 5 story that if you want to play Persona 5, you need to play Persona 5 World because it's the proper story that I feel like Atlas, the developers, have wanted to tell, but now they're able to do it. And it's it's really enjoyable. The characters, the world, the world building, uh, the whole thing about like the metaverse and Personas, just... It, it's, it's brought upon a whole new world to explore with, you know, Personas and stuff like that. And it's something that I'm really into now. So hopefully whenever Persona 6 comes out, I'll get around to playing that as well. And I hope that it's just as enjoyable. And hopefully I can get around to playing Persona 3 and 4 if I can ever get the chance to play them. But for now, I've played Persona 5 and Persona 5 Royal, and I hope to play it again and experience the memories that I had the first, the first time through playing Persona 5 World all over again down the line. 
I highly recommend this game if you haven't played Persona 5. And if you're thinking about getting Persona 5 Royal, I highly recommend it. And just enjoy it for what it is worth and for what it does and the storytelling that it does do. And just appreciate what the game attempts to try to do. So, without further ado, it's time to wrap up the video. If you did enjoy it for whatever reason, be sure to leave a like. If you're already subscribed for more videos just like this. Uh, stay safe out there because I'm normally doing anime review ep uh, episode reviews. Uh, on a weekly basis for currently right now Boruto, but because of the whole coronavirus, uh, we haven't been getting episodes on a week-to-week -week basis anymore, and it's been two weeks in a row since we've gotten one, so for your sake, stay, stay safe out there, wear a face mask, for, bleh, wear a face mask whenever you go out, wash your hands uh, daily, that's without a question, and uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video, hope you guys have a fantastic day, I'm out, peace. So, what